بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, dear professors and colleagues uh, I am welcoming you to this SNT webinar on behalf of uh, Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation and on behalf of uh, SNT online CME coordination team under uh, supervision of Professor Hani Hafiz uh, the SNT president uh, our webinar topic today is about malnutrition and sarcopenia among patients with CKD which will be presented by uh, Professor Rafat Hagazi and will be moderated by Professor Amr Hussein. Uh, please leave your comments and questions in the chat box below, and they will be answered by our speaker, moderator, and expert attendees at the end of this session. I will leave, I will leave the mic now for Professor Amr Hussein to introduce Professor Hagazi and to introduce the webinar topic in depth. Please, Dr. Amr. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abdel Gawad, for this uh, nice introduction. Um, this uh, webinar was arranged by Dr. Hussein Shaisha uh, a couple months ago. Uh, I, I was proud that I'm the one who introduced Dr. Hagazi to Dr. Hussein Shaisha. And last September, when we have another webinar, Dr. Hussein was moderating another webinar in nutrition and CKD patients. Then I, he was talking to me and I asked him, do you know Dr. Hagazi? He's a nutrition expert in America. And he said, no, I don't know him. He, I told him that he is uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Hagazi's brother, you know, older brother. And uh, Muhammad, Dr. Muhammad Hagazi is a friend of Dr. Hussein and he is uh, from the same uh, class, uh, 1991 in Mansoura. Then he was very happy and I got Dr. Hagazi on the phone and introduced him to Dr. Hussein. And uh, Dr. Hagazi actually uh, nicely accepted the invitation to moderate the um, other topic uh, three, four months ago in September, I think end of September, nutrition webinar. Then Dr. Hussein, of course, he, uh, you know, saw the intelligence and the interest that Dr. Hagazi had so he invited him to give this lecture uh, on malnutrition and cachexia and CKD patient. And this was planned to be in early November. However, because of the terrible loss that we have, uh, you know, uh, we lost Dr. Hassin in uh, late October, I think 31st of October, this webinar was delayed. As you see here, uh, this is Dr. Hassin. Uh, Shaisha uh, text, he texted me and uh, he was saying that he was glad that Dr. Rafat Hagazi, the expert in nutrition in America, was able to uh, contribute to the last nutrition webinar. And here he is saying that after talking to Dr. Rafat, he's telling me that he uh, sincerely and nicely accepted to talk about this uh, very interesting topic. Let me introduce to you Dr. Uh, Rafat Hagazi. Dr. Rafat Hagazi is a professor uh, in the Department of Preventive Medicine at Mansoura University. He left Egypt uh, uh, about, I think, 25 years ago, and uh, uh, he is now a head um, and a global medical uh, director and, uh, at uh, the scientific and the medical external engagement at Abbott Nutrition. He uh, originally graduated from Mansoura Medical School in 1989. He finished his master's degree in occupational health in 1995. Then after that, he uh, went to America. He had a master's degree in nutrition in uh, University of Pittsburgh, 1998. Then he had an, a PhD degree from Pittsburgh uh, as well, 2002. After that, he joined uh, University of Pittsburgh as a faculty. Then he moved from the academia to Abbott Nutrition 19, uh, 2009 uh, till present. Uh, his research was funded by several organizations and uh, uh, um, agencies, including, include, including Cancer Research Foundation of America. He uh, contributed in six uh, book chapters. He has two patents. And he is a reviewer in several journals, including uh, prestigious medical journals like American Journal uh, of Nutrition and New England Journal of Medicine. 
Here is uh, Dr. Hegaz's uh, H index, 24. Uh, that's uh, uh, terrific. He has more than 2,000 uh, uh, citations and more than 64 publications. He has more than 230 uh, co-authors, and his major contribution is in the area of malnutrition and cachexia in different medical aspects. His talk today is malnutrition and sarcopenia among CKD patients, diagnosis and the management. And as we know, sarcopenia and muscle loss and malnutrition is a big contributing factor in our patients' morbidities and mortalities. I'm not going to talk about the whole mechanism uh, behind the sarcopenia, but I, I will uh, let Dr. Uh, Hagazi talk about this in details. I'm just going to highlight here the importance of this topic because I think there is uh, underdiagnosis and under-management and the mismanagement and under-reporting in this condition in sarcopenia and the muscle loss and protein energy wasting in our patients. Because as you see here, this is a publication that uh, was, uh, uh, you know, including and involving CKD patients with cachexia and evaluating the protein energy wasting since 2007 to 2018. As you see here, both with the protein energy wasting and cachexia and CKD patients, we have averaged about 30 to 40 publications every year. Of course, these are among thousands of nephrology publications we have every year. So despite that, this is a major uh, health problem. Uh, we still, I think, uh, in both clinical and the research uh, area, we are lacking diagnosis and management. And of course, sarcopenia and functional limitation and disability is a major cause of death. Hopefully, after listening and learning from Dr. Gazi in this lecture, we can um, get to know more and learn more about this condition. I will finish with this slide. Uh, this is the first publication that Dr. Hassin Shaisha uh, did. 1998, he published this in American Journal of Nephrology. And his first publication was about nutrition, about optimization of dialysis and protein intake in neuromuscular uh, function in our dialysis patient. I remember when I joined Mansoura Urology Nephrology Center, Dr. Hassin was doing his uh, uh, thesis and he was recruiting a patient to his study in, his, uh, uh, in the dialysis unit at Mansoura Urology Nephrology Center. And I remember he was giving uh, uh, more nutrition, including uh, oral nutrition, including increasing uh, the dinner or the lunch protein content of our patient and also optimizing their dialysis. And of course, just in three months in 22 patients, he was able to improve their neuromuscular status with optimizing both their dialysis and their nutrition status. Of course, he had some hardship after he stopped doing that. And after finishing his study, patients went back to their normal protein intake. So instead of eating half chicken in the lunch, he, um, you know, they are back to one quarter. And so, so their protein intake was less and they were not very happy with that. And, uh, uh, but he was very, very successful to recruit patients and to prove that improving in nutrition and the dialysis adequacy would improve our uh, patient neuromuscular function. I will uh, stop here and let Dr. Hegazi to share his slides. I'm very happy to have Dr. Hegazi today. He's really an expert in this field, and I'm very sure that we will learn a lot from him today. Dr. Hegazi, please unmute yourself. Okay, is they hear me now? Yes. Okay. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amr al Hassini. Thanks, Dr. Muhammad Abdul Gawad. And thanks of all to Dr. Hassin Shaisha. God bless him and rest his soul. 
I can't, I cannot speak enough. When I heard the news one day, morning day, when I opened Facebook and I saw his picture because I just got to know him like a few weeks before. And we just, you know, exchange ideas and, and we agreed on presenting and moderating. So to me, it was a huge loss to add to the losses that we have in 2020. But I think that his legend will continue and we should continue his legend by doing this, by exchanging scientific information, by uh, whatever we learned through our experience, experiences and expertise, just sharing them in a platform like this. So thanks for all of you who participated, moderated, organized, and thanks Dr. Hussein. So today's topic, as Dr. Amr said, I'm gonna talk about malnutrition sarcopenia among patients with CKD because it is underdiagnosed, it is undertreated. And part of that, because of we as a nutrition expert community did not do a good job in, in, in unifying the definitions, in unifying how to look for this disease, how to diagnose it and how to manage it. But the good news is we have some made some progress that's I'm gonna share with you today. So today uh, we're gonna, rather than the usual objective slide to discuss and review and we, we keep looking for, for names, I'm gonna uh, answer, hope to answer or address these question. What is malnutrition and sarcopenia? It is, is it common among CKD patients? Is it serious that we should look for, treat, manage? And how to diagnose it and then how to treat it like any other disease? When we used to uh, a study in medicine, you know, probably 30 years ago in School of Medicine, and unfortunately until now, if you ask um, a physician or a student, what is malnutrition? The first thing come to our minds was, you know, the poor, unfortunate uh, kids in Africa with marasmus and kwashiorkor. And that has, you know, everything is almost towards like because of reduced food intake and whether the food intake is reduced, whether it's a protein or a mix of protein and carb that leads to either protein calorie malnutrition or protein malnutrition. However, the underprivileged kids, and, and actually that's not in underprivileged areas only, it exists in our community, those who cannot of us, who cannot afford to buy healthy food choices or food choices in, in, in fact. But what we have shifted our understanding throughout the last two decades into disease-associated malnutrition. In other words, you might see it in the literature as disease-related malnutrition. So, you know, when you look for, please look for those two. Because the idea that disease comes with its effects that can hinder nutrient absorption, nutrient intake, nutrient assimilation to meet the nutritional needs of every patient that we see. So now we shifted our, our understanding from just to reduce food intake as the main cause of undernutrition or malnutrition into disease and disease associated inflammation leading sometimes to the underfeeding. Patients reduce their appetite because of uremia, reduce their appetite because of uh, taste changes that's associated with toxicity associated with chronic end stage renal disease, a patient lose their food intake because of they cannot swallow, chewing, dentition, uh, maldigestion. There's so many reasons that's associated with what the disease can cause malnutrition. But very importantly, that disease comes with chronic inflammation. And this is an area that I personally spent many, many years studying throughout my PhD, postdoctoral fellowship, and, and now in my current days, because inflammation changes the way our body utilizes nutrients intake. So whatever we intake food, 
whenever we intake food, usually the body in normal status depends on energy from carbohydrate. And that's where you produce the ATP required for every biologic mechanism in our body. And if we have a patient who have a disease associated inflammation that shifts, carbohydrate is no longer the, the preferred utilization, resource utilization for energy production. The body actually shifts to protein and fat stores. And that reduces the energy stores, the protein stores, and the fat stores within our body. And that's why you see those patients with in the stage renal disease having this protein energy wasting. I, as you can see here, I did not use the protein energy wasting as my title. Because my, my, if, if you want to leave out today's talk with one thing, I think the, the point I want to highlight is do not wait till the patient is wasted. And we have to think of malnutrition as early and sarcopenia. I'm going to explain in a few slides that malnutrition, when it is associated with sarcopenia, that's when we should highlight the risk and we should intervene. So the catabolic events that that's associated with inflammation, that's associated with underfeeding, that is our modern day understanding of malnutrition that we should all think about. In fact, we modeled the burden of disease associated malnutrition back in 2010 and were published in ESPEN. It has a huge uh, cost on all countries involved when we have a high prevalence of disease associated malnutrition. And this is the advances in our understanding that I'm gonna walk you through. So in 2012, the Aspen, American Society for Parenteral and Internutrition and Academy of Dietetics and Nutrition. Those are the two major nutrition societies in the US uh, related to clinical care. I don't wanna uh, you know, step on other societies, but uh, when, when they came up with this beautiful etiology-based definition of malnutrition algorithm, exactly saying what we were saying, what we were thinking of, that inflammation should be presented as part of the etiology of malnutrition. If you look at this uh, categorization of malnutrition, you ask the first question, the nutritional risk, is, uh, the, is the patient having low food intake or loss of lean body mass? Then the next question is inflammation present. And if the inflammation is not present, then this is starvation related malnutrition. This is purely under intake of protein and calories required to make the energy uh, resources. If the patient has yes, if they have inflammation, that is two classification, mild to moderate inflammation, that's chronic disease related malnutrition. The first one they highlighted is CKD and cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, sarcopenic obesity, or you find this in the ICU. Patients who are admitted in the ICU for sepsis burn trauma, they have severe inflammatory stress that leads, again, the point is when you have inflammation, the body starts not to utilize glucose into in the bloodstream. They start to break down muscle and fat to utilize it because inflammation blocks the cellular response and uptake of glucose and utilization as a preferred source of energy. It actually reverts to protein and fat. So hopefully I'm, I'm trying to make, you know, aware of where we're going with this field. And so you can actually start to think differently about it. Do not just look for those cachectic patient who has lost her BMI less than 16 to say, oh, the patient is malnourished. Or you don't have to wait until the patient is telling you, I cannot eat anymore. They have lost food intake for a while, but we never asked them. So we never identified the problem. This is my own humble, I'm, I'm working on publishing this theory or, or this kind of algorithm, putting it all together. Because in fact, when WHO defines malnutrition, they define it as one of three categories. Micronutrient related malnutrition, undernutrition, and overweight and obesity 
they consider those as also malnourished. So malnutrition does not have to be related to weight. You can find a, a, a patient whose BMI is 40, but the muscle mass is so depleted that those patients have what we call sarcopenic obesity. And those are malnourished as well. The WHO defined actually obesity-related chronic diseases as malnutrition, meaning diabetes, coronary heart artery disease, or uh, coronary heart disease, chronic heart diseases. Uh, they define obesity-related uh, uh, all the chronic diseases that associated with obesity as part of malnutrition syndrome. So if we just focus on undernutrition, then the adults undernutrition. Uh, will be following those uh, categorization of GLIM. I'm not going to bombard you with this. Maybe we're going to talk about it later on. But I just want to let you know, think differently about it, what you mean by malnutrition. So what is sarcopenia? Based on the 2019 definition of sarcopenia in this blue box, sarcopenia is a progressive and generalized skeletal muscle disorder involving an accelerated loss of muscle mass and function that is associated with increased adverse outcomes, including falls, functional decline, frailty, and mortality. Big, big definition, but let me simplify. We lose muscle mass as we age. That's a fact of life. In fact, there is a saying I don't know if you're familiar with. You are one person before you reach to the age 40, and you are a different person after you hit that age 40. What are we talking about at age 40? We're talking about, if you look at this uh, curve of muscle, protein, muscle accretion and loss throughout our age, from adolescence till 25 years, we are accumulating, we're building muscle. And then we hit a plateau from 25 years of age to 40 years of age. There's nothing much, much happening here. But once 48 hits uh, our age calendar, we start to lose up to 8% of our muscle mass per decade. And that, at the age of 70, become doubled, become 15% average of muscle we lose when you start hitting the age of 70 and forward. The good news is uh, don't be uh, you know, uh, kind of scared, oh my god, what I'm going to do. So, the good news, it's variable, meaning it depends on our lifestyle that we choose to live in. That the, 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 the prevalence is not 100%. In fact, it's about 50% what we're talking about, meaning that we can do something to slow down that rate of loss of muscle that we, that we have when we age, when we are taking care of our bodies in, in terms of sleep, stress, exercise, and diet. When we talk about the loss of muscle, we, don't, we have to remember that muscle is part of something bigger called the lean body mass. Lean body mass is anything but fat and water, meaning that muscles, organs, bones, cartilages, tendons, cardiac muscle, these are all, you know, cardiac muscle is not exactly the type of skeletal muscle that like skeletal muscle, but it is considered as part of muscle or lean body mass in general term. The lean body mass in general is so important for our mobility, for balance, generation of heat, most of the base uh, of the uh, um, uh, base metabolic rate is actually derived from our, uh, from our muscles protein amino acid pool for skin, immune digestive system survival during period of stress. So how sarcopenia occurs? Why we lose all this muscle throughout aging? There's so many factors. And we can just summarize them as uh, Dr. Bodhi in, in, uh, in 2015 summarized it very nicely as you can ha have the sarcopenia because of increased level of expression or activity of myostatin, low protein intake, decreased blood flow, capillary flow, hormonal changes, reduced neuronal stimulation, inflammation, oxidative stress, lipotoxicity, decreased activity or bed rest. So 
this is the sarcopenia as we know, just to the age associated. This mechanism gets accelerated by diseases that are associated with chronic inflammation like CKD. So at the end of the day, the loss and the accretion or the synthesis and degradation are very important. Both of them are important. In our advantage, it is great to build muscle protein and prevent the degradation of muscle protein. So we come to a positive uh, net balance. And how we do that? We do that by good diet, by exercise, that's to build muscle uh, protein, and we decrease the impact of activity, uh, for example, le uh, less bed, more bed rest, that's actually not good, so we start to mobilize patients, uh, decreasing or avoiding the intake of high protein, quality protein in our diet. Uh, as we said, insulin resistance, that's not also good. Uh, the, the actually management of the disease, if we just leave the disease unmanaged, that's probably also will drive muscle protein degradation as well. In 2012, we tried to put the two together, malnutrition and sarcopenia, and we published this called malnutrition sarcopenia syndrome. What we were trying to say that we should look for these five things in our patients, and that they are so important for outcome, meaning that we should look for the reduce or food intake, appetite loss, unintentional weight loss, low muscle mass, low muscle strength, and low muscle function. And those will dictate the prognosis and how we manage the disease in our patients with CKD as well. Then we, we publish that as well, saying that the many, many terms and definitions and items that are in the literature, if you're looking at protein calorie malnutrition, undernutrition, hospital acquired, disease related, this is what we are. We can see here on the on the other side: frailty, deconditioning, sarcopenic obesity, cardiac cachexia, cancer cachexia, ICU acquired weakness, protein energy wasting, are all but an inherent mechanism that is the same. When you have inflammation, reducing food intake for whatever reason you have reduced food intake, you have inflammation drive, loss of lean body mass. That's when start to see the increased morbidity, increased mortality, economic impact, becoming a big health toll on our healthcare resources. So I'm gonna now shift to the published data in CKD patients. We know that the term protein energy wasting is common among patients on dialysis. And as you can see here, some parts of the world, especially in Asia, they have 61 to 80% of dialysis patients are having protein energy wasting. That's a huge number. And in fact, in, in, in our beloved Egypt, the rate is about 20 to 40%. And as you can see here, the range, what we're talking about is huge. Like when you say 20 to 40, that's a lot. That depends on how do you diagnose protein energy wasting, which tools of nutritional assessment to use in that publication to end up with this uh, prevalence rate. The other fact that is so important that not only during dialysis that protein energy wasting or, or malnutrition is on sarcopenia is very common. In fact, in AKI, in acute kidney injury, patients might range of malnutrition ranges from 60% to 82%. And that has to do with what we just talked about with the presence of severe inflammatory stress during the ICU admission. And in non-dialysis, CKD patients stage three to, to five, we're talking about with a range, again, back to the big range between 11% to 54%, depending on which tool you use to define uh, PEW. And that's actually with an average of 22%. Why it is common, why it is protein energy wasting, malnutrition, sarcopenia is common among patients with CKD. Because as you can see here, I'm not gonna just uh, uh, list uh, or, or you, you're probably more aware of, of those factors that in patients with CKD that all affect the way our body utilizes nutrient and how we assimilate nutrient in metabolic uh, functions. 
For example, what are the factors that can lead to decreased food intake in patients with CKD? You have loss of teeth, poverty, dementia, uremic toxins, anorexia due to medicine, due to impaired taste, mood disorders, inflammation. Also, I want to highlight one thing in patients with CKD. We know that diabetes is a common comorbidity in our patients. We know that cardiovascular disease is a common comorbidity in our patients. So imagine a patient that you're trying to, through diet, what we call medical nutrition therapy, try to adjust the diet of this patient to reduce the progression of CKD, to reduce the progression of diabetes and its complication or CVD and its complication. You're talking about a very restrictive diet. One of them will, you, you probably reduce protein intake, sodium intake, phosphorus intake, potassium intake. One of them you're reducing simple carbohydrate and all the carbohydrate or what we call high glycemic index food. One of them you're gonna reduce for cholesterol lowering, you're gonna follow the DASH diet or whatever diet it is. There is a very, very many reasons that CKD patient could be at highest risk of malnutrition and sarcopenia. And the added to what I just mentioned is the nutrient loss during the dialysis itself. And whether this is a hemodialysis, hemofiltration, continuous hemofiltration or peritoneal dialysis, there is an incremental loss of amino acids and protein throughout the process of dialysis. You're talking about for uh, hemodialysis, six to, 12, six to 12 grams per session of amino acid being lost. In peritoneal dialysis, for example, two to four grams per day. So the other moving on to the next topic, is it serious? Should we care? Why should we care? It is very serious. Look at those evidence-based, many, many studies, many meta-analysis showing that protein energy wasting, malnutrition, sarcopenia is associated with uh, increased cost, increased hospitalization rates, low physical function and poor quality of life, increased risk of infections, cardiovascular disease, decreased survival, and reverse epidemiology. So one will ask, like, what is reverse epidemiology? Reverse epidemiology is very interesting phenomena that now we consider serum cholesterol is actually a good thing in patients with protein energy wasting because patients has severely low cholesterol level. And we look at patients who are obese actually associate with better outcome because of the severity of the fat loss that happened during the process of catabolism that those patients who still have fat actually do fairly well. When we look at some of the studies and I'm just collecting some of them, like for example, if you look at malnutrition diagnosis by SGA or subjective global assessment, which I'm gonna mention in another slide now, that those patients over a follow-up period of seven years, patients on in dialysis, actually those patients who are well-nourished, look at the well-nourished, which is uh, uh, 67, that the upper line, versus the severely malnourished, which is one to three score. They are talking about with two times, twofold higher risk of mortality within seven years. And look at the separation very quickly. You can see this difference in mortality between well-nourished patients and malnourished. In fact, throughout my years in nutrition, mortality is a very, very sensitive outcome of nutritional uh, optimization and malnutrition that we have so much evidence in many disease processes that malnutrition associated with mortality. For many reasons, I'm gonna show you in, in few slides. What about dietary protein intake? Actually in proteinial dialysis patients, the uh, patients who had the highest tertile of protein intake were at very, very advantage, very huge significant advantage in terms of all cause deaths, cardiovascular uh, disease, and the first episode of peritonitis. So patients with low tertile have almost double the risk of first episode of peritonitis, cardiovascular death, and all-cause death than the highest tertile. And what are these numbers? What are we talking about? Like the dietary protein intake in patients on dialysis. We're talking about 
the highest fertile is more than or equal to 0.94 gram per kilogram per day. And the lowest fertile is less than 0.73 grams per kilogram per day. Another highlight of the talk, remember patients on dialysis should receive at least one gram per kilogram protein per day. That 0.7, which is by the way, 0.7 is so interesting. 0.7 is what we advise to decrease the progression of CKD chronically for patients who are in CKD to decrease the progression from one stage to the other. That's why we ask them to be around the 0.7. But patients on dialysis, you start at one gram per kilogram per day. And if you don't know how to measure that, that's not a problem. But please make sure if you don't know to have a dietitian, have a nutritionist, develop somebody in the hospital who has this expertise that those patients can follow with, with those experts in nutrition. It's so important, as you know, medical nutrition therapy, I, I don't know if you know that, but medical nutrition therapy, which is following up patient's nutritional status by dietitian to make sure the patient is receiving the right diet, the right uh, amount and the right type, is actually reimbursed in the United States healthcare system because of the benefit, because why they see uh, there is a benefit of doing so. This is interesting. This is now the evolution of our understanding and that's why I'm showing you the most recent. In 2019 in, in uh, I think University of California, they have done this very interesting study. They looked at markers of sarcopenia as muscle mass and muscle strength and muscle function. And they tried to correlate which one would predict survival in patients with uh, uh, patients on dialysis. If you look at the figure, you would appreciate this is the adjusted hazard ratio, which means that you have everyone is adjusted for the other factors. That you can appreciate here that the hand grip strength is the only significant predictor of mortality, not muscle mass. So let's let's think for a second. So, Dr. Hagazi, are you telling me to, to follow muscle mass or muscle strength? Which is one is important? I think I would say if you have the ability to do both, that would be fantastic. But do not just depend on muscle mass. Probably muscle strength is very, very important to follow. And muscle strength here, what we're talking about is hand grip strength. Hand grip strength is a uh, uh, I don't know how we mean have it in your institution. It's a it's a dynamometer that can measure hand grip strength, which is like a, I'm going to show you a picture of that in few slides. But that's one way to measure muscle strength. The point here is not to measure it as a cutoff ratio or a cutoff value. Is to follow up patients throughout the years. Is to make sure that the patient is not losing that level of muscle uh, strength or the hand grip strength that you have captured in the last year or last six months follow-up period, that the patient is at least maintaining or, or increasing that muscle strength or the hand grip strength. Now, I think I talked about with malnutrition, it's association, sarcopenia, malnutrition association with mortality and how it's very important. And, and we see it throughout all diseases, not only CKD. It has to do with that malnutrition or malnourished patients at a huge immune disadvantage. Nutrition is a major, major, or it's, it is the major influencer of immune function. So in uremia related immune dysfunction, this has been um, described both activation and suppression of the immune cell system. And what do you mean by that? So activation in terms of secretion of cytokines, we have increased IL-6, uh, TNF-alpha, IL-1 beta, all of that decreased IL-10. But on the other hand, we also have suppression of, of function of immune cells. There is decreased chemotactic, phagocytic, and bacterial activities of neutrophils. There is impaired antigen-presenting cells and T-cell uh, lymphocyte interaction, and that's very important. This is actually how you start an immune response. That's the first thing into the body 
uh, mechanism to fight infection, for example. So the immune function is so related to the uh, malnutrition or the nutritional uh, elements because, for example, I give you examples. I know we can talk about this for the whole day. T cells, what is the major fuel sources of immune cells? It is glucose and glutamine. So it's an amino acid and a carbohydrate. If you don't have that, if you have the cells having a problem getting in the glucose inside the cells, there is a problem of function. And, you know, so for, uh, so on and so forth, so talking about the gut associated lymphoid tissue and its association with all uh, mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, that's a whole different topic. But the point is, men are patient are at a huge immune dysfunction uh, risk. Yeah, this is very, very nice table that was put by Kovisti uh, and, and colleagues, and it shows like why we think that malnutrition leads to death. There is no way you can say malnutrition leads to death because of that, because in order for us to do that, we have to measure every function of every organ, including every immune cells in the body. But what we know is uh, patients who are malnourished have immunodeficiency, uh, the sarcopenia itself reduces the cardiac muscle function and reduces skeletal muscle function. The loss of fat tissue, actually fat is a good sequestration organ for uremic toxins. So you reduce that uh, cushion, decrease production of anti-inflammatory cytokines, increase level of age, uh, lipoprotein, decrease ability to bind to circulating in the toxins. And then you have what we talked about with the increased inflammatory cytokine release. So what should we do? We talked about the problem. We talked about how important it is and how prevalent it is. What should we do? So how to diagnose malnutrition? Malnutrition, sarcopenia, protein energy wasting. I'm not gonna talk about the different names. You have to do that irrespective of the name. You're, you're looking at the new definition of malnutrition as we talked about. So we have to screen every patient. So it's a process, screen everyone, assess the nutritional status of those in those who have high nutritional risk. And then once you assess, diagnose malnutrition. So what are the differences? Screening is an easy tool that every clinician of us should do it for every single patient. Something we didn't learn in our medical schools. Unfortunately, I'm fighting this battle with my colleagues throughout the world medical education or nutrition, so important. Number one, we should educate our medical students. Screen nutritional risk in your patient. Because all what, you know, you know what, that, what that takes? Two questions. Have you reduced your food intake throughout the last six months? Have you lost weight unintentionally throughout the last few weeks or few months? Those, that's it. And those two questions, there's a, a tool called the Man Nutrition Screening Tool, or MST, could identify those who are at risk. Then what should I do with those at risk? I should refer them, if I don't know how to do a full nutritional assessment of nutritional status, I should refer them to somebody who can do. I refer them to a nutrition or a physician nutrition specialist in my unit because the high risk doesn't indicate that this patient will be malnourished. We have to do a screening first, then assessment. Once the assessment come up with yes, 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 the patient is malnourished, you have to diagnose And what do we mean? You have to document it in the chart. We have to document that this patient is malnourished, sarcopenic, and once that has been documented in the chart, that should prompt treatment, you know, and I, I don't want to tell you a story of uh, one time when I was in the clinical field and, and uh, you know, a clinician told me like, I, I don't want to document something that I don't know how to treat. I, I respected that point, but I think we should find those who can treat, who can manage this uh, problem. Otherwise, we're going to continue seeing this underreported, underdiagnosed uh, problem that keeps affecting patient outcome throughout uh, our next generation. So let's talk about nutritional screening. I told you about two questions that you should ask. Man nutritional screening tool, that's a tool that's developed by uh, Ferguson, Mary Ferguson in Australia. 
And uh, the, qu the, que the two questions, have you lost weight recently without trying? Have you been eating poorly because of a decreased appetite? That's it. And then there's a scoring system and the patient is, if, if the score is two or plus, the patient is at risk of malnutrition, you have to refer them to people who can do the assessment. So what's the assessment? There is another, again, validated, I'm talking about only the validated tool. So MST is a validated tool. M MUST, which is M-U-S-T, that's another validated tool. SGA or subjective global assessment is a validated tool to assess malnutrition or assess nutritional status. And what uh, subjective global assessment is, you ask the patient the same question that we used in the screening, plus other questions about GI function, functional capacity. When, the, when you do the physical examination, you report to those are, who are, which are related to nutritional status, meaning that the muscles, whether there's muscle wasting or not, whether there is subcutaneous fat wasting or not, edema, and ascites. And those, and there's a scoring system that uh, six to seven is well-nourished, four to five is at risk or moderate, and one to three is malnourished, one is severely malnourished. Again, the tool exists that maybe that subjective global assessment will require about five to six minutes of somebody's time. But I think that it is absolutely worth it. And again, you know, the dietitian can do it. Um, I, I fact that uh, in the U.S. now dietitians are being trained, uh, trained to do that physical assessment of patients so, so they can document it to help the physicians uh, in the journey of the nutritional care plan. And the assessment, as I talked to you about, that you can sometimes feel, you know, those signs of malnutrition when you assess the patient for for your specialty. You can look for, as you can see here, severe muscle wasting, uh, uh, chest muscles, uh, facial muscles. But this also, this is a patient who have severe edema, uh, obese and severe edema in the ICU. Do not be fooled by that. This is not in overnourished. I heard that from a lot of people. This is an over, it's not, there's nothing called overnourished by the way. This is an obese patient who probably have tons of muscle loss because of the severe inflammatory stress that drives the, the, the muscle protein gets uh, catabolized within days in the ICU to a severe extent of muscle loss that happens during the few days of ICU stay. And then you can look for temporalis muscle. Here is the hand grip strength measurement or that we call dynamometer that I was talking to you about. That's actually, I have been seeing uh, centers around the world that are incorporating that muscle uh, strength measurement by the hand grip now in their clinical assessment. It's very simple. In fact, one of the studies we did <clears throat> for hospitalized medical inpatients elderly, we were surprised that a lot of those patients have zero hand grip strength of zero kilogram, meaning that they couldn't even move uh, the arrow. Uh, to just to give you an example, like a man uh, in, in their 40s probably will score like 60. You know, it depends on ethnic uh, variations, on uh, age, gender, all of that. But there, and there are tables, of course, for those. So that's one way you can assess in your clinic. And there is one digi digital now. There's actually digitalized form, forms of that. You don't have to have that big bulky one. There is actually a digital format that you can a score, assess, and follow of the patient muscle strength. How to diagnose? Now, we moved from the assessment to uh, screening to assessment to diagnosis. So in, uh, in 2012, the Aspen and a and as I mentioned, the two major societies of nutrition in the US published this criteria to diagnose malnutrition. They say that all what you need is two out of six criteria to diagnose malnutrition. Again, it's very interesting. Insufficient energy intake or food intake we talked about, unintentional weight loss, decreased muscle mass, decreased body fat, fluid accumulation, or decreased hand grip strength again and again. All what you need is two out of six to diagnose malnutrition. And, and this tool has been validated since uh, been published in 2012. It has been validated in many different patient settings. So you could have reduce muscle mass and reduce the hand grip strength to diagnose malnutrition. 
Remember how we talked about malnutrition and sarcopenia are so inherently together. So that's what I was talking about, that our understanding, by the way, you didn't see here serum albumin, very important. You didn't see in the six criteria serum albumin. You didn't see BMI. Why? Because we're moving away from total body into body composition. And serum albumin is a marker of inflammation, not a huge, a sensitive marker of nutrition. If you look at the 2008 ISRNM diagnosis of protein energy wasting that was published, and I know a couple of uh, Dr. Kalantar and uh, Dr. Folk, um, those, when, when they published this, they said on what you need are uh, four categories. You need one positive, uh, you need, so, okay. So it's four categories, you need three, meaning that you need one of each or one category that's positive to diagnose PBWE, meaning that if you have a BMI less than 23 and a mid-arm circumference uh, more than 10% in relation to the 50 percentile of enhance and you have serum albumin less than 3.8 and you, un or you just have these three, that's diagnosed the uh, uh, protein uh, wasting. The problem with that is, Look at this here in the muscle. They actually included only muscle mass. And I think our understanding now of the muscle strength and how important it is maybe in the next upgrade or the next update of that, maybe that muscle strength would be added. We don't know yet. Something happened in 2018 where all major nutrition societies worked on a consensus diagnostic criteria of malnutrition all major nutrition sites throughout the world. Work it for three years, they met, they invited everybody expert in the field, we talked, we discussed, and they ended up in this beautiful criteria to diagnose malnutrition. Uh, they said that you have two criteria to choose from, one of each. So you need one etiologic criteria and one phenotypic criteria to diagnose malnutrition. So what that means, if the patient has reduced food intake or assimilation, that's if, that, if just have that, you check. If the patient has inflammation that's manifested by the disease process, you have an, for example, a CKD patient, for example, that's, that's a definition of inflammation if the patient is not well maintained, there's ongoing disease process, meaning there is ongoing the, the chronic inflammatory process. So you probably, let's say a patient with CKD, you already know that this patient is progressing. That's actually checked without even asking them, have you reduced weight? You already checked the etiologic criteria. All what you need to do is look for one of three phenotypic criteria in addition to an inflammation to diagnose malnutrition. So you ask the patient, have you, do you have unintentional weight loss? If yes, plus the inflammation, that's diagnosing malnutrition right there. If you have uh, low BMI uh, and, and you know, low BMI was a hot topic between the European and the American experts, so they didn't want to include, so they, they decided to include it because for example, in, in the United States, we don't see the BMI less than 18.5 a lot. Um, that's why it was a, a matter, but it was included as a one phenotypic criteria and reduced muscle mass. How can I uh, diagnose reduced muscle mass? We, I'm not gonna tell you, do DEXA for every patient because that's not a clinical tool. You can use it for um, a bone mineral density, but you're not gonna use it for muscle to, uh, for a clinical setting. So you have CT scanning, which we do a lot to our patients. And there are three software that you can diagnose low muscle mass from CT readings, MRI, uh, BIA, bioelectrical impedance test. And this is, has been, I'm seeing this in the literature being integrated in a lot of clinical centers around the world. And then reduced uh, muscle strength that was not added, but it was added as a supportive uh, uh, criteria. Like if you have reduced hand grip strength, you can also add it as a supportive uh, uh, measure. You can also from the glim from this criteria uh, actually stage meaning grade the severity of malnutrition, whether it's moderate or severe, depending on how much weight loss or what is the BMI. For example, if a patient less than 70 years, 
less than 18.5, that is severe malnourished. Um, and then the reduced muscle mass, depending on validated assessment tool that we mentioned. Okay, so we diagnosed the problem. We now have a malnourished patient. What should we do? And this is the when it comes to the nutritional care pathway. This is where we uh, have so many tools that we can talk about. I think Dr. Amr talked about Dr. Hussain asking the patient to increase the protein intake when dialysis. That's dietary advice with nutritional counseling. You can do that also, but adding oral nutritional supplement while the patient is in dialysis or while the patient having the disease process to go on in the hospital or outside of the hospital to reach to the protein that we defined as, if you remember, we said like at least one gram per kilogram per day for patients on dialysis. How can you meet that by advising patient to eat more or you can add an oral nutritional supplement. If the patient cannot meet by either or the oral nutritional supplement or the nutritional counseling, then enteral tube feeding or enteral nutrition by tube feeding comes along. That's the next step. If the patient cannot even meet that through that because of GI uh, obstruction or there's a contraindication for enteral feeding, then you go for parenteral nutrition with or without enteral feeding, depending on the situation and the patient. So nutrition care, care pathway is a very individualized. It's so individualized, but it requires somebody who understands exactly how to process, how to follow up the patient, how, how to measure protein requirements, how to follow patients' protein intake and protein and energy intake, micronutrient intake. So it's an individualized. That's sometimes I feel like having a specialist, a dietitian, a physician, nutrition specialist is so important. Or if you as a clinician, as a nephrologist develop this passion for to learn this, it's not rocket science and, and you already have gone through a lot of medical education. You can absolutely pursue that education through a lot of nutrition fellowships and resources that's available now than ever before. So the nutritional requirements is number one step. I'm um, sorry, we are going over time, I think, but uh, we're, we're almost there. So nutritional uh, requirements are also very dependent on the patient requirements. And there is a lot of individualization. For example, if you look here, energy is 20 to 30 kilo, kilo, kilocalorie per kilogram per day. Carbohydrate, let's look at the protein. Let's go to a protein. If the patient is non-dialyzed, that's 0.6 to 0.8. If the patient is on dialysis with moderate catabolism, that's 1 to 1.5. If the patient has severe hypercatabolism, that's 1.7 uh, up to maximum of that. But you have to follow patients to address all this, uh, to make sure first that they're getting it, they're acquiring it, and then you can do the change as we talked about. I'm going to show you, unfortunately, some of the myths that I hear from my clinician colleagues is, oh, Malnutrition happens with the disease. And when the disease is treated, patients will recover and they will eat and everything goes to normal. Unfortunately, that's not true. Because the way we handle nutrition has to be early. It has to be early because the more you wait, the more losses that you probably cannot uh, uh, replete in the future. I give you a very recent study that was published in Lancet. This is probably the largest intervention in the mice control trial that's in the history of clinical nutrition that we were so excited about uh, uh, by Dr. Phil Schutz and his colleagues. What they did is all medical, so the, let me go through the, the study design. So those were medical inpatients. So those were hospitalized medical uh, patients enrolled in the study, exclusion, critical care or post-operative, not surgical, long-term nutrition or terminal condition. That's not included. What included is once the patient is admitted, they have nutritional risk scoring using must more than three, estimated length of stay is more than five days, written and formal consent as this, that's it. They were not excluding any type of patients. In fact, all medical inpatients were included. And they randomized them into individualized early nutritional therapy according to nutrition guidelines, or control group, which is standard nutrition provided by hospital kitchen according to patient appetite. 
This is in AIDS West Hospital, they recruited 2,088 medical and patients with a median age of 73 years of age. What they did is a very stepwise intervention, nutritional intervention using all the principles that we just talked about. You start with level one, which is oral nutritional. Uh, you ask the patient to uh, increase fortify, fortifying uh, meals, uh, eating between meals, uh, adapt to preferences, and oral nutritional supplements were given in 90% of patients were given oral nutritional supplements to meet the patient's requirements as estimated by uh, the patients, the clinicians actually in the study. All what they needed is to reach a protein requirement of 1.2 to 1.5 gram per kilogram per day. And uh, as you can see here in renal failure, they had the set up at 0.8 with no dialysis. They have to get a multivitamin use. This is in the intervention group. And a specific targets, so like when you do diet fortification for kidney patients, you go for low potassium and renal failure and oral nutritional supplement as well. So you then you do assessment to every 24 to 48 hours. If the patient that does not meet 75% of energy and protein requirements, you go to the next step, which is um, you, you go for interim nutrition, which is tube feeding to meet the nutritional requirements. And then again, within 24 to 48 hours, you do the same assessment and the patient does not get 75% of energy and protein, you go to the next step, which is parenteral nutrition. So this is an intensive, personalized, and early nutrition intervention. Patient has to start being fed within 42 hours of admission. And what, are, what is the result have shown? So the, the primary outcome was a composite outcome of mortality in uh, uh, 30 days, readmission, uh, hospital complications, uh, uh, admission to the ICU, it's a composite score. What they have showed significant decrease in the composite endpoint to the point that you can see early separation within days. You can see separation in terms of specifically the mortality dropped in the intervention group and, and the uh, hazard ratio 0 0.65. You got 35% reduction in mortality, 30 day mortality by this intervention. And as you can see here, they were successful in reaching the calories and the protein intake they meant to do in terms of the protein and calorie intake that they achieved. And what's very interesting, I'm showing you this a table of the subgroups. And you can see here that the mortality was significantly reduced in chronic kidney disease in, patient, in those patients. It was probably the only statistically significant reduction was seen in chronic kidney disease patients by, by chance. Uh, very important study, very important result finding. So reduced adverse events within 30 deaths. These are the summary of the study results. Decrease all-cause mortality, fewer patient experienced decline in functional status of more than 10%. In fact, we did a similar study in 2014 and we published in 2016. That was actually very close and uh, that study was, at that time, the largest study at that time until the, the EFFORT trial came along. When our study, we had malnourished older patients with cardiopulmonary diseases. And we, instead of individualize early as we did in the EFFORT, we give them an oral nutritional supplement early, as early as to within 24 to 48 hours of admission every patient got supplement to high protein. It was high protein or nutritional supplement uh, to increase the protein intake as early as early as possible. And what we have shown, uh, we had a composite outcome of mortality and readmission. The readmission was not statistically significant or the composite, but the mortality rate was reduced at day 30, day 90, at day, day 60, at day 90. We were surprised by our finding, but not specifically, not actually surprised because we have smaller studies showing the same thing, that when you feed patients in the hospital who have elderly manners, you can expect also, when you feed them early as early when they admit it, you get a mortality benefit, a survival benefit. And of course, we showed that over time that patients who have got the supplement were being able to decrease 
their malnutrition and risk, and they went from severely malnourished to uh, 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 well-nourished quicker than those in the control group. After that study, the effort trial was published uh, later 2019. There was a meta-analysis, including our study, the NORSH trial, and the effort trial. And what do you expect? You expected that mortality significantly reduced with early intervention or and even readmission as well, 30-day readmission. These are the results, uh, study results of this meta-analysis that was published in JAMA uh, Open Network, lower rates of mortality, reduced rate of non-elective hospital readmission, higher nutritional, uh, higher nutritional outcomes, meaning higher energy and protein intakes and, and increasing body weight in malnourished patients, which is a good thing. Or nutritional supplements. So those are a complete and balanced. You can have a disease-specific, renal-specific or nutritional supplement that is lower in uh, potassium and phosphorus. And those have been shown to increase and improve the nutritional outcomes that we're talking about, whether it's a calorie protein intake, serum albumin, SGA, increased body weight, uh, bone mineral density, uh, hand grip strength, which is very important the uh, pro supplementation of protein improves nutritional outcomes, but effect on uh, overall outcome like clinical outcome, like mortality, infectious readmission is not clear. But let me show you this study uh, from uh, the, um, the US group led by Dr. Lexon, which was very interesting. They retrospectively followed patients so in, their, in their hospital, in, in their uh, uh, renal dialysis uh, hospital system, they actually give every patient during the dialysis three times a week, they give them oral nutritional supplement during their dialysis session. And whether it's a supplement or a bar, they make sure that the patient gets that. So they ret retrospectively looked at time to death, retrospectively looking at a separation, nice separation for those patients who have received supplements as compared to retrospective control before they started this process, uh, patients who did not receive the supplement. Huge separation effect on survival. Then another prospective study was done using the similar technique in patients who have uh, renal, uh, renal patients on dialysis as well, giving them oral nutritional supplement. That was prospective. And as you can see here, there is also a, a nice uh, decrease in mortality uh, uh, this is probability not hospitalized as well in, in uh, the study, but there was another study also showing decreased risk of mortality. Uh, we cannot say that we should improve nutrition alone to improve muscle. We have to mention the exercise, the effect exercise. And when we say exercise, there is the major two types, the aerobic exercise, walking, jogging, swimming, and the resistance exercise, the weightlifting and, and, and others. Uh, push-ups and weightlifting and stuff. Both are important for different outcome benefit. For example, if you're looking for muscle mass and muscle strength, definitely resistance exercise will be the better one. If you're looking at long-term fat mass, uh, this will be uh, decreasing the fat mass. This will be probably the two of them. If you're looking at resting heart rate benefit, that's probably aerobic exercise. So the best, the best advice to tell your patients is, do a mix of aerobic exercise, try to walk, uh, you know, jog for 150 minutes a week if you can. Uh, try to uh, just weight lifting of a small lifting or, or some push-ups in the morning, whatever you can. And then also stretching. That's very important also for another benefit on uh, resting heart rate as well. So to summarize, Malnutrition and sarcopenia are common and important diseases to manage in patients with CKD. Comprehensive nutritional care, including screening of nutritional risk, assessment of nutritional status, and diagnosis of malnutrition. We cannot treat any disease that's not diagnosed. So we have to diagnose malnutrition so we can move the needle into the therapy aspect. And then an early and personalized nutritional therapy improves nutritional and clinical outcome in patients with CKD. Thank you uh, so much. I will give it back to Dr. Ang. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hagazi, for this fantastic uh, presentation. I really like uh, your approach and the style of your presentation. 
And uh, one of the most important thing is your last slide when you talked about exercise, because this was my first question. Uh, because um, the muscle is not only a product of hydration, uh, but also a product of exercise. Oh, you your sound. Hand and hand uh, together. Dr. Amr, I can't hear you. Uh, Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, the muscle is not only a product of nutrition, but also a product of exercise. Uh, so it's very important uh, uh, because you go hand in hand, I think, because you can still uh, lose muscle and get sarcopenia even if you are uh, having good nutrition and vice versa. Um, True. So one of the uh, other comments that I have for you is uh, the bone health. And the bone strain also goes hand in hand with uh, the muscle strength. And sarcopenia, there is also what we call osteopenia. If you lose muscle, probably you're going to lose bone as well. 55% at least of the, our bone components are protein, the collagen, type one, which is a protein. So protein is not only important for everything, in, you know, mainly for skeletal muscle and to prevent, uh, uh, you know, the sarcopenia, but it's very also important in our CKD patients uh, to maintain normal bone health. As we know, our CKD patients, they start to lose bone and uh, what we call it CKD MBD, chronic disease bone marrow disorder, they really have bad mineral uh, bone disease that not only including the bone quantity, but also the bone quality. Uh, one more uh, quick comment is here in America, they call, uh, I, I hear this very nice quote, that you are what you eat. And I'm very sure that you're, you're saying the same thing to your patients. I hear another quote that you are what you eat, eat. Because you don't only have to eat healthy, but also what you eat has to eat healthy to have the end product of having good uh, nutrition. Um, I would just like to ask you a quick uh, question regarding sarcopenia in different adults population and also after transplantation. Because as you know, that um, our ultimate goal for our end stage kidney disease vision is to get a transplant. So what's your advice regarding the nutrition and avoiding sarcopenia and hemodialysis, proteinial dialysis, and kidney transplant patients? Very important. In fact, to Dr. Amr, as you know, um, pre-transplant, this is a great window for us to optimize the nutritional and protein uh, status of our patients. And in fact, there is a lot of association, exactly the similar, I, I didn't have just the time to include the slides that the association of muscle mass and, and uh, function or strength and outcomes in transplant patients as well. So in, in fact, there is a lot of transplant centers, not only renal transplant, but multi-organ transplant in general. They do this rehabilitation concept where they optimize the nutritional status of the patient, improve the muscle function, improve the muscle mass, improve the nutritional status because it, the studies have shown that this improves the clinical outcome post-transplant as well. You don't want to have a patient who is immunocompromised because of malnutrition going into transplant. And this is the fact that we don't track, we do not diagnose what do you mean by immunocompromise. In fact, we don't diagnose malnutrition to begin with. Uh, but I, I just tell you that, in fact, there are so many studies where, for example, like in cells, like in, in vitro, when they put, for example, oral nutritional supplements and, and tube feeding formulas that we use a daily, co-culture them with macrophages, that actually decreased the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines from, uh, from the cells. 
meaning that nutrition is so important for optimizing nutritional status. There is other data about improving the body ability to fight infections and viral infections and others. So I think wound healing as well, uh, poor, poor post, post transplant wound healing is not gonna benefit from having a patient who's protein or energy undernourished. So it is very important topic in fact. Very good, very good, very good, thank you. Uh, another comment is, and you mentioned it uh, very quickly, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that. You talked about personalized medicine and the precision medicine. So, because we would like to treat every patient as unique, special person. It's very hard just, you know, to put everybody in the same basket and treat everybody the same because, uh, you know, there is no sh uh, shoe size fits all. Every single patient has to be treated individually and with a precision medicine. So I think uh, maybe you can help me with that, but my, my gut feeling is we have for every patient to um, evaluate his intake, you know, calorie intake, protein intake, the protein calorie, uh, you know, uh, intake, and also the losses, you know, including the vision as diarrhea, you know, protonoria, if the patient has, a, I, I saw one uh, question in the chat room that, you know, some patients, you know, or, 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 you know, significant portion of our patients, they are losing protein in their urine. They have significant protonoria. Some of them, they, you know, lose 10 gram, you know, 20 gram, whatever, especially diabetic patients with bad uh, diabetic nephropathy. So this is a, you know, movable target, I think, intake, output, uh, evaluation of the muscle status, evaluation of the catabolism, because some patients at certain times they have they are hyper, you know, catabolic. Sometimes they are not. So the catabolism is different. It's not uh, a static, but it's rather dynamic target. Also, infections and inflammation. Like some of uh, our patients, you know, good portion of them, they are still dialyzing using catheter, and catheter induces a state of inflammation, not necessarily infection. If they got, you know, uh, peritonitis or if they got catheter-related infection, that's another infection that can also, um, you know, induce malnutrition. But how can you personalize or, you know, use precision medicine to treat our sicky division and to uh, make sure that they are getting proper nutrition? Yeah, and, and you know what, uh, Dr. Amr, this is very important. It's a whole process, meaning it's a, it's a science, it's a medical specialty. And, and I think that it's not fair that somebody who's not well-trained in that to ask him to do that, I think, or her. So I think the, the issue is for, for example, like in the nutritional therapy teams in the US, you mentioned the, the inputs and outputs. That's something actually they have in, in their charts, I's and O's. I's and O's are so important for nutritionists. How much you intake and how much was lost. That's very important. Another factor is the patient have diabetes? Is the patient, does the patient have diabetes? Does the patient have chronic uh, heart disease? Does the patient have uh, on immunosuppressive drugs? You know, there's so many factors. Is the patient on bed uh, for a long period of time that you probably have to take care of uh, pressure ulcer or pressure injury. So I think the point is, yes, we have absolutely to adjust everybody and adjust their intake according to the status, but I, I advise having a specialist in nutrition on, on the team or some the, sometimes the clinician actually themselves become experts by pursuing that knowledge. It's not a rocket science. There's so many ways you can be trained in nutrition and get a very, you know, Aspen do have their uh, courses, ASN, American Society for Nutrition, uh, Aspen, everybody has their own, uh, you know, courses and stuff that can help you with that. And I'm sure Dr. Hussein Shaisha, uh, God bless his soul, he was very interested in that. I know that for fact that uh, he wanted to do, uh, we, we even talked about like having nutrition course or something. Um, so yes, it is very, very specialized. It is very precision medicine to your point because a CKD patient with chronic, with chronic heart disease and diabetes is different from just CKD patient. Uh, the age matter, 
the amount of losses are, are absolutely so it's precision medicine is individualized that's why you see the effort trial was so successful and and reaching this in 2000 patient you see this 0.67 reduction of mortality 30 days mortality uh, because they were aggressive enough to meet the patient energy and protein requirement according to their needs there is uh, there is renal specific diet as you know there is renal specific formulas so everything is very specialized and and, and you know you have to uh, take it all in and, and make the best decision for the patient nice thank you so much i just want to highlight one more thing you mentioned it very quickly uh, the nutritional status of patients on hemodialysis compared to peritoneal dialysis, because they are very, very different. So the caloric intake, and uh, I, I, you showed us one slide, which is uh, very uh, informative. The caloric intake for peritoneal dialysis patient is much, much higher than the caloric intake for hemodialysis patient. So they get more calories. Uh, especially if they are high transporters, they are absorbing more glucose based solution during their peritoneal dialysis nights. So they are on a positive, you know, caloric uh, balance. However, when it comes to protein, the BD patient, peritoneal dialysis patient, they lose more protein, significantly much higher than hemodialysis patient. Uh, also, the appetite might be different. Maybe a hemodialysis patient might eat better. So it's very important, especially in peritoneal dialysis patient, to do evaluation and periodic evaluation for their nutritional status. And sometimes we have to supplement them with more protein and we have to restrict their calorie intake. Uh, what's your intake about this, Dr. Hagaz? Totally agree with you, uh, Dr. Amr. The, the, it's all about the protein. <laughs> if, if you think about it, the number one, when, when we are sick, when, when we are sick, the number one nutrient that we lose appetite is two, protein. And it is very well known that in malnourished patients, they get protein aversion. Uh, appetite to protein decreases. Like you're not going to ask a patient to take um, a, 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 full, a, a handful, a piece of a steak and you expect them, they will take it. You know, it's very, very hard. Protein is the source of not energy during catabolism, but also the source of, which is very important. And I think I mentioned that immune cell uh, substrate, energy substrate. I told you that T cells and macrophages, they feed on glucose and glutamine. So glutamine is an amino acid. And if you don't have enough resources of glutamine, that's a problem. You don't have glucose because of insulin resistance, and you don't have glutamine, what we call, by the way, glutamine is called conventionally essential amino acid, meaning that in periods, in, in times of stress, like peritoneal dialysis, uh, like patients in CKD, th those are, this is the times that the protein is so important to be derived to, to, to fill this, this gap in immune function, and in, in, uh, in heart as well, in, in cardiac muscle, by the way, also they use ketone uh, for, for, uh, for energy, which is derived when, during catabolism also from the fat stores. So it is very important that we go on for protein and make sure the patient gets enough. This is the most difficult. And by the way, the benefit of oral nutritional supplementation, there's no magic about it. It's just because you get a lot of protein in a liquid form in a palatable way. That's, that's probably the most important thing about this, if, if you're struggling with meeting dietary intake with food. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And also, I just want to emphasize one more thing. You mentioned it, that intradialytic parenteral nutrition doesn't improve any other outcome. It might improve the serum albumin and some surrogate markers of nutrition. But when it comes to improvement, the uh, harder endpoint it doesn't. So we don't recommend the key DIGO uh, guidelines. We don't recommend uh, giving our patient interdialytic parenteral nutrition, which is very different from the interdialytic uh, protein oral uh, supplementation. Uh, one more thing I like to mention, and you also mentioned it briefly. Um, so 
in the past, you know, back in days 30, 40 years ago, nephrologists used to advise patients to restrict their protein intake, maybe to 0 0.5, 0 0.6 gram per kilogram per day. And this is, of course, might uh, avoid the uremic symptoms, might delay the progression of the CKD, but actually this increases mortality. For me as a nephrologist, I don't care if I start my patient early, you know, six months or a year on dialysis with a good nutritionist status, a strong person, and this person probably is going to tolerate dialysis better. He will be a good transplant candidate. His quality of life will be much better than uh, another patient who I delayed his uh, start of dialysis six months or 12 months on the expense of he is malnourished, you know, and his quality of life is bad. And probably his mortality will be high and also he will not be a good candidate for transplantation. Can you please comment on that? It's a great point, uh, Dr. Amr, and this is one of the major challenges in, in for CKD patients because you have on one side, somebody is telling you not to eat a lot of protein and, and you get the patient on the, on the risk of being malnourished or, or sarcopenic because all what you need, I don't know exactly. I mean, again, this is a very controversial topic, I think, in, uh, but to your point back to the precision medicine aspect. So patients who are elderly, patients who have uh, other com com comorbidities, I don't want to recommend low protein diet and leave the patient to come to me as protein energy manager or protein manager patient, because to your exact point, this, this patient will not do well on dialysis, will not do well long term. So it's a, it's a follow up. I think it's a major follow up point that you have to customize to your patient, but you have to follow also the patient in, in terms of knowing what are you looking for. In, in to, to simplify the matter to just GFR and the progression based on epidemiologic data, when you know epidemiological data is, is done on thousands of patients. But when you get to the patient, the precision medicine, as you just mentioned, the, the, diff, the matter different. So I agree with you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just have uh, two more comments, then I will leave the mic uh, to Dr. Abdigawad. Uh, my um, first comment is, can you please uh, comment on plant versus animal uh, uh, based protein intake? Uh, we know that, you know, our protein intake, our CKD, uh, you know, patients protein intake should be between 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram per day. But uh, does it matter if this protein intake is uh, from plant sources or from animal sources? Oh yeah, that's a very good question, very contemporary question. And the whole point about plant-based being very common now, you can hear it in, in a lot of, by the way, not just in renal patients, but in diabetic and cardiac patients and, and, and so on. So, okay, here is, the, here is the fact that we know. Plant proteins are not in the same bar as high biologic, what we call high biologic value protein as animal protein. That's a fact. Meaning that they do not provide all the essential and non-essential amino acids to the point that animal protein does. So with that being said, in, for me, before asking the patient to be on a plant-based diet, I have to be very, very uh, following the patient and uh, making sure that they don't get a decreased intake of some certain amino acids that are so essential for muscle protein synthesis. So with that being said, I mean, the, the whole point of why we say like animal protein uh, is, is probably that optimal because, you know, animal protein, you're talking about a high fat as well. I mean, you're gonna take a good source of, of eggs. For example, you're gonna have to take the cholesterol with egg. If you're going to take a good source of beef, then you're going to have to, to deal with all the cholesterol yeah. and omega-6 fatty acid that's in, in the mix. So it's not just a, a simple cut of uh, plant versus protein of animal because it comes with a lot of other stuff. 
Uh, there is some data in, uh, in decreasing insulin resistance, for example, with plant-based diet. I agree with you because the, the, here's the thing, you're looking at it from a macro perspective. You're not looking at it from a long-term uh, studies, uh, making sure that you get the enough amino acids that you need. So with that being said, to summarize a very, very complex topic, I would say, if you resort to, um, to plant-based diet or plant-based protein, please make sure that you have in, in that advice, all the essential amino acids, the muscle, needs for muscle protein synthesis. That's terrific. Thank you so much for this explanation. Uh, my last comment is, I usually say in every uh, single thing in our life that moderation is the key. So of course, malnourishment is a major problem and is associated with increased morbidity and mortality for our patients. And I understand that the concept you said that there is nothing called overnutrition. Uh, you know, you know, and please excuse me for my ignorance here. So um, nowadays, on the other spectrum, especially in youth and young, you know, men, we are seeing that these guys are more interested in getting a lot of protein supplementation, making muscle. You know, they are not even a weightlifter or bodybuilder, but they just want to have bigger muscle. Not necessarily they exercise, but they take much, much more protein through the supplements. I would say, you know, and this is uh, might be confidential, that every single time I go to visit Egypt, my nephews ask me to bring, you know, with me instead of giving them gifts or presents, you know, this protein uh, supplementation. And, you know, we have debates in our family, is this, you know, good or bad? And uh, my brother, you know, I remember his comment on that, that his son doesn't care about the strength of his muscles. He just, you know, cares about how he looks, how big uh, his muscle is. So uh, can you please comment on the other spectrum, you know, uh, eating or, you know, getting more protein supplementation, uh, especially with this, you know, youth, can this affect their um, kidneys and also does it have any bad implications in general? That's a great question, uh, Dr. Amr. I think I mentioned it, but from the other side of the spectrum, which is, is it muscle mass or strength and function? is more important for an even in malnourished patient. And we showed data that muscle strength is probably is much more important than muscle mass. I think the same thing applies on the other side of the spectrum. You know, building mass because you're just feeding the, uh, you know, the molecules that produces more muscle protein fibers, I, I, muscle fibers is not the way to go. You know, and uh, we have to care about not only uh, the kidney function, but also insulin resistance and others, you know, when you go excess, go in excess. Um, I think muscle, muscle function, muscle strength is very important. Muscle strength, whether you have a bulky muscle or a, an, a moderate muscle that can correlate with uh, functioning. But I think the point is, if, if, you, if you know what you're doing, if you're under medical supervision, if you're measuring your, your kidney function tests, if you're, if you're making sure also you, go, you don't get into the hormones that stimulate muscle also, which is a, a, another big topic that un, un, uncontrolled and it leads to disastrous uh, conditions in some patients with genetic disorders or something. So yes, I think you know, if, if we look at it, it is muscle strength and muscle function is much more important than muscle mass on both sides of the curve. We don't recommend, uh, you know, these uh, habits for our youth to take much, much more protein that they need. I would not. I well, there's nothing called like this. Here is the thing: if you are exercising that much, then there is a, a capacity, and the anabolic resistance is very low in in patients in a small, like younger kids, younger athletes. 
if you're exercising that much, then there is a period that you can actually bleed that muscle without incremental harm. But as we said, like it is the 25 years of age when you get the plateau, meaning there is not much more than that, you know? So 25 to 40, starting at the age of 40, we have to be careful not to overload the kidneys and, and the other functions of the body. Thank you so much, sir. I will uh, give the mic to Dr. Abdi Gawad uh, to uh, just uh, walk us through the questions. And I saw uh, several smart questions in the chart too. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Higazi, for actually for this actually illustrative and comprehensive lecture. We have some questions in the chat box, but uh, we would like to hear first from uh, Professor Faisal Shaheen if uh, he has any uh, comments regarding uh, this topic. Please, Dr. Faisal, if you are still available, unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you hear me now, isn't it? Okay. We hear you well. Thank you. Uh, it's elegant uh, talk, uh, Dr. Hijazi. Actually, I enjoyed very much. And uh, I wonder, you know, I have the same concern like uh, what Dr. Amr mentioned about hypoalbuminemia in uh, BD patients because uh, we know that BD is taking a lot of albumin out of the body and this can... Uh, can affect the nutrition of the patient. I know that you mentioned that albumin doesn't reflect the malnutrition of the dialysis patient, but still we are using albumin as a parameter of nutrition and, uh, and the dialysis adequacy. Uh, so uh, we need some formula which we can just make it quickly, not to have this, you know, uh, a lot of investigation, a lot of measurement in order to know either the patient is malnourished or not uh, for our dialysis patient. We use KT over V, we use uh, uh, barathormone, uh, we, we use anemia, and we were using albumin as a parameter of the good dialysis. What we should do in the future now, after this elegant talk? So thanks, Dr. Faisal. It's a very common question that I get all every time I speak about serum albumin because it's confusing. You know, it's very sensitive marker of mortality, for especially in, in patients with CKD. It's like by, by 0.1 milligram per deciliter, every it's like very sensitive marker. But when you talk about nutritional optimization, because it has association with inflammation as well. Here's the good news. Serum albumin is, if we said that serum albumin is a marker of inflammation, now inflammation is part of the diagnosis of malnutrition. So here is what I want you to do. In addition to low serum albumin, please ask the patient two questions. Have you lost weight unintentionally recently? And have you reduced food intake recently? And if the answer is yes to one of them, then that's a high risk patient that you probably should follow up either yourself or a clinician who's very aware of nutrition, work with those patients on that. So consider serum albumin as a marker of inflammation, but add to it as a nutritional marker. And the two that I mentioned, unintentional weight loss during the last uh, three months, and then uh, on, uh, the, re the reduction of food intake. So that's, that's the simplest I can answer, and there's so many long answer to this, but I, I'm trying to make something that you can integrate in your clinic. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so now we have uh, some uh, questions in the chat box. Can you see uh, yes. my screen, Dr. Hayes? Yes. This first question, what type of exercise and duration to decrease sarcopenia in normal and hemodialysis patients? So, yes, I mean, it's very, very hard to me to say like which, which um, uh, to decrease sarcopenia in normal, but I'm going to tell you what we know about what healthy exercise is. If we're talking about the guidelines about 150 minutes per week, of combined exercise, of aerobic exercise like jogging, you know, walking in a speed, not just walking, but 
walking in speed and mix that with some physical uh, 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 resistance training, resistance training meaning weights, whether the weight is your body by doing push-ups or the weight is different, very small amounts of weight, anything that can help decreases the burden of sarcopenia over time. And, and remember, starting there actually might start good things in nutrition as well. Meaning if you start moving, if the patient starts walking 20 minutes, once after you pass 20 minutes, the patient feels good about themselves. They can do more. And it's always like the, the recommendation I give, like walk the first 20 minutes and you're gonna feel your body asking you to do more. It's the first 20 minutes is the most difficult and you don't have to do anything drastic. You can just walk very casual, but then when you feel like your body is like warming up, just to start to move quicker. The same thing with resistance training. You can start by just small weights, very affordable ones, do it for a couple of weeks. And then once you get comfortable with it, increase the weight a little bit. It's the whole point of increasing the amount of weight so that will gonna get the muscle to stimulate protein synthesis. Uh, so these are the recommendations that I can tell you based on the data that we have and it applies for a lot of, uh, for all of us actually. Just to make a quick comment here. Yes, sure. Yes, sure. Uh, I think as a nephrologist, uh, we need to take advantage on the time that our hemodialysis patients <coughs> on our clinics. So these patients are staying for three, three and a half hours, four hours, three times a week uh, during their dialysis session. I think it would be a great idea if we can improve their nutrition and also their exercise. I saw uh, some uh, publication about using or ergometers or any kind of even, you know, hand grab, you know, strength and exercise during dialysis. Just in three months to six months, you can improve the sarcopenia, you can improve the muscle quantity and the quality, the muscle strength that Dr. Hagazi was talking about, not only about the muscle mass, and also you can can um, improve their BMD, the bone marrow content. You can improve the when you do a DEXA scan before and after. Just three months, I saw a couple at least of uh, publication randomized clinical studies when they put the patient on, uh, you know, doing uh, some uh, ergometry exercise on dialysis and they examined their muscle and their bone before and after. Very, very fascinating. The other thing is nutrition. And of course, we don't advise our patient to eat during the, the dialysis because they can develop hypertension and uh, some hemodynamic instability. But at least after finishing the, their dialysis, we can also supplement them with uh, protein, uh, uh, you know, uh, supplementation to improve their uh, protein and, uh, and the nutrition itself. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Amr. Second uh, question is how reliable lipid profile, potassium, and albumin in assessment of patient nutritional status? Yeah, I think we touched on the albumin um, a little bit. I don't think that you, I mentioned like many, many um, consensus diagnoses. We never mentioned lipid profile or potassium. Um, so I would not ask for them to be included in, in further nutrition assessment. Probably serum albumin is close to the whole inflammation aspect. In the past, in the history, like 50 years ago, total cholesterol level was part of assessing the risk of malnutrition, but we don't have that now. You don't see it in any of the recent guidelines on nutritional assessment. So I think, you know, having a validated screening tool and a validated assessment tool is very, very important. Um, the second question. About obesity paradox. Remember? Yes, yeah. about obesity paradox. Yeah. Is there yes, obesity paradox? Right. There is obesity paradox in, in a lot of diseases, <clears throat> not only in dialysis patients and transplantation. Obesity paradox is where you get the benefit of having fat. In, and you get the benefit of that. That's to that point. Like you really, because of the low, very low muscle mass, the only the only way to find 
the non-carbohydrate uh, utilization of, of energy or sources of energy is fat. So that's probably is valid for a lot of ICU patients, not only CKD and transplantation patients. Yes. And final one in this uh, picture, did you recommend dietitians to be a part of the dialysis center team? Yes, yes, and yes. yes. This is, I said, like where, where we have the time of physicians is so limited to spend with the patient to do a full physical assessment or to do a full diagnosis. I think having an extra help will definitely be somebody who knows exactly what to tell the patient especially for complex patients that have a lot of comorbidities that everyone needs some dietary adjustments. Uh, so definitely, I, I would say yes. Yes. And, uh, I, I, would, I would add Dr. Abdigawad and Dr. Yes. Hijazi here and our uh, renal clinics, you know, the dialysis clinics, it's multidisciplinary team. We should have five as the numbers of our fingers and, and, and our hands, five, uh, you know, uh, person in our team. First is the physician, then the nurse, then the technician, then the dietitian, and the fifth one is the social worker. So to be able to cover all aspects in our patient's uh, life, we have to have these five persons. Otherwise, if, if you are lacking any of these, you will have, uh, you know, disaster uh, increase in morbidity and mortality. Yes, uh, this question is about the new uh, hypoglycemic medications, uh, new renal protection agents like SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. Uh, do they decrease uh, weight or not? I think they do in, in patients who, have, who need the weight, meaning like obese patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, they, there is benefit of those in the new the new generation of, of those medication for uh, an extra benefit plus the A1C, there is a decreased weight. Um, but I think it, they're talking about a healthy loss of weight. I'm not sure about it. It's a question about it decreases weight as a bad thing in renal patients or, or, or in as obese goal, patients. As, as extra benefit. Uh, yes, I yes, think. yes. Yes, I completely agree, especially GLB1 uh, is, is a stronger. It can help to lose weight uh, significantly. But when it comes to GLT2 inhibitors, about two, three kilos uh, weight loss on average, not like huge. So we have to be realistic. Our expectation has, has to be realistic. As a most important thing, when it comes to SGLT2 inhibitor, it loses weight because it loses more calories, you know, the, the patient loses glucose in their urine. So yeah, we are talking about losing bad weight here, you know, losing more calories and hopefully with, uh, you know, improvement of uh, A1C and uh, with uh, some of the ketosis, because uh, uh, we, we have to remember that this agent can induce ketosis. So this might be also associated, I, I don't know if Dr. Haggad will agree with me on that, that you are going to start to lose bad weight and you might also, uh, you know, uh, gain some good weight. I agree, Dr. Amr. I, I just want to comment that we don't look now at weight loss as an entity. We look at which composition of the body has been. Are you talking about loss of muscle weight or loss of fat weight? So this is a bad and good weight. Yes, yes, exactly. Good weight, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so we have the BIA now. We, you can measure BIA can give you the that compartmentation of, of the lean body mass, whether it's fat or muscle. So I think something like this very important. That's that's a very, very uh, important point, especially when it comes to the ulcers vision, because they can gain weight because of fluid retention and overload rather than increasing muscle mass. Yes, we don't want to lose muscle mass at all. <laughs> okay, uh, we have uh, some little questions. I think three or four. In proteinuric CKD patients other than diabetics, did you recommend high protein or low protein diet? Which one of them? Yeah, I think we talked and Dr. Amr mentioned the word yes. precision medicine that patient will be different. So in, you know, in, in entity, in, in entirety, 
I wouldn't recommend a low protein diet, to be honest, for a long period of time, if you're not following the muscle mass and the muscle strength over time. Just to give a blank statement, go on low protein diet and leave patients to live on their own and come and see them in two years, lost muscle is a poor practice. Uh, I think nutrition, nutritional care is a follow-up science and, and, and an entity. You have to follow up patients. You have to, you cannot just recommend something for and, and just leave the patient to live on their own. Uh, the risk of sarcopenia is probably outweigh the risk of um, if, of increased uh, GFR. And, um, you know, again, back to the point, every patient is different. You have to follow those patients with, uh, with, with your care. Okay. Completely agree. And uh, just one more point. So practically what <laughs> we do is we calculate the protein loss in the urine. So say, for example, if the patient is losing six grams of protein a day because of the proteinuria, we add these losses to our expected or target uh, protein intake. So if, is, you know, say if our target is one gram per kilogram and the patient is 60 kilos, this means that the protein intake should be about 60 gram a day. We add six gram of the protein loss to the 60, so it will be 66 and so on. Okay, we have uh, three more questions. Can we depend on serum creatinine on assessment of malnutrition and sarcopenia? No, I think we don't. And we never mentioned it in, in my review of all the recommendation by societies and guidelines. I would not recommend uh, creatine. Um, is it creatine or creatinine? Creatinine. He wrote crea creatine, but he, I think he meant creatinine. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend serum creatinine as well. Uh, it's not one of those markers that could assess malnutrition or sarcopenia. You're going to miss a lot. So, right. uh, please, yeah, go ahead. But on the other hand, when you have a huge guy with a lot of muscle mass with a higher creatinine compared to malnourished guy, yes, this might be an a good indication. So don't be panicked that the BUN or the creatinine is high. This might be actually good news that this patient is maintaining good muscle mass. Sometimes yeah. we start dialysis very late. I, I have patient African American big guys who start the dialysis with creatine of 20, uh, while sometimes in frail uh, uh, white ladies who start dialysis with creatine of four or three, right? So yes, it's it's kind of a marker of not the not really the nutrition status, but the muscular muscle. Uh, Observation much more than the nutritionist. Yeah. And yeah. might reflect more. And I don't know if Dr. Hagaz, what do you think about the urea nitrogen, the blood urea nitrogen as an indicator of the nutritionist status? Yeah, I, I think you just summarized it very well, Dr. Am. It's a marker of deciding when to start dialysis, I think, based on the, the, your understanding of the muscle and the bulk of muscle in patients. And uh, that, that might be true. I think what, what we were talking about today is a disease called the sarcopenia that, and malnutrition that you probably need something validated so you can detect it in the right way and you know how to treat it. So if, again, you know, we talked about malnutrition screen tool or, or GLAM criteria or Aspen A, A and D, those could be easily integrated in your care to diagnose malnutrition and sarcopenia. And of course, muscle protein, uh, muscle mass measurements, hand to grip strength, all this st uh, stuff. This is these are validated, meaning validated tools, meaning that they have correlated with the disease, and the intervention has decreased or, or improved that outcome measurement. So you know that's that's where we have to ask the patients to do. It. One more question about uh, why exercise it shows did show much benefit regarding CKD progression. I think he is asking about one of the studies you showed. Why, why exercise did show much benefit? Okay. Regarding progression, yes. Yeah. So the, the whole point of exercise, the whole point is to improve muscle function and mass. So why we have to have mu good muscle? Because muscle is a reservoir of amino acids that the body can depend on when in catabolic state. 
Muscle is so important for immune function. Muscle is so important even for hormonal, uh, for hormonal and endocrine regulation of many hormones and cytokines and chemokines. Uh, muscle is a producer of important molecules that can regulate even insulin secretion. So improving muscle in general is absolutely a good thing for CKD patients, in fact, to any patients, to any one of us. Okay. We have uh, one last question for uh, Dr. Hegazi and one for Dr. Amr. Uh, Dr. Hegazi, how can we re reverse uh, malnutrition, inflammation, atherosclerosis syndrome in patients on hemodialysis? Oh boy, reverse. <laughs> reverse is a very, very uh, ambitious outcome, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> I don't think that we're gonna reverse things because in chronic diseases, in chronic diseases, all what we're trying to do is to mitigate the progression and to, to mitigate the effect of inflammation and atherosclerosis. As you know, chronic kidney disease associated with a lot of, uh, of vascular dysfunction, meaning uh, arterial, uh, um, uh, for example, pulse wave velocity, that has been studied, which is a marker of arterial stiffness or uh, elasticity, uh, endothelial dysfunction, dysregulation. So all what we're trying to do is to prevent progression, not to reverse. I, I think that reverse reversal is 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 very ambitious outcome. What do you think, Dr. Am? Yes, yes, I completely agree. Reversal is very ambitious. I think delaying the progression might be the, the better word. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with you. Okay, we have one last question for Dr. Amr from the chat box. Did you recommend, do you recommend weight reduction surgery when indicated before transplantation? Uh, yes, yeah, this is a smart question. I think the idea is every single uh, uh, transplant center has its own policies and regulation and guidelines. So here, like our program in, in University of Kentucky, the uh, donor and the recipient should be under uh, 35 of BMI. So if the patient is, or the donor is above that, we don't accept. So again, this is our, the, our patient's responsibility to get below this target. Can they do it by exercise, controlling their diet? That's, that's good. If they can do that, we recommend the patient to go for a bariatric surgery. The problem, it's very hard for our dialysis patient to lose weight, not because of anything, but because of their quality of, of life and their lifestyle. Uh, most of our dialysis patients, they end up by having kidney disease, you know, failure because they have diabetes, they have metabolic syndrome, they don't uh, exercise, they are not very ambulant or very active. So, and once they start the dialysis, now they are more, uh, you know, bound to the machines and their quality and their lifestyle goes down. But yes, the ultimate goal is to have a certain BMI that sh they shouldn't exceed because of the post-operative uh, uh, complication is high and the post-transplant medical and surgical complication is high in such population. So, Bottom line is we advocate for uh, weight reduction either by you know physiological ways like exercise and control food or medical ways or surgical ways doesn't matter but the vision has to attain this uh, or achieve this target. Thank you, Dr. Amp. So uh, before uh, Dr. Amp uh, closes this uh, webinar session, I would uh, like to share with you the link for our YouTube channel, SNT YouTube channel. I shared it in the chat box. Please subscribe to it. And this, uh, the video of this webinar will be uploaded in it. So please, Dr. Amr, uh, close the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Hagazi. Thank you, Dr. Amr. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hagazi, for this uh, very, very uh, informative and thoughtful lecture. I really uh, you know, learned a lot today, and I like your presentation. Uh, hopefully, everybody uh, who attended uh, or who will listen or watch this on YouTube will also benefit from this. And I think this is uh, just the knowledge that we gained today, and we have to change this.
to a practice, we have to include this and incorporate this to our daily uh, practice because words doesn't make any difference till we adopt it and we take it to acts and to actions so we can change uh, our uh, practice to a better way so we can improve our uh, patient uh, qual you know, quality of life and improve their survival as well. I really, uh, you know, thank uh, uh, Dr. Hagazi for this intelligent presentation, and hopefully in the future we'll have, as he mentioned, and as our, uh, you know, lovely person, Dr. Hassan Shaisha, was planning to have, you know, dedicated courses because, as Dr. Hagazi <coughs> mentioned, as physician, we didn't learn in our medical schools the nutritional aspects and nutritional issues. We need to get more familiarized with this problem and hopefully with somebody who has this, uh, you know, uh, very experience, very good experience like Dr. Hagazi is very, uh, you know, really expertise in this field. He can teach us and we can learn more and more from him. Thank you so much, everybody, for sure. your time and attendance. And we'll see you later in uh, other webinars. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Thanks you. Bye-bye.